Good afternoon and welcome. This year we have a theme for the General Assembly of the EGU, which is a voyage through scales. A voyage through time scales, a voyage through space scales. And related to this general theme of the EGU, we have two talks that are targeted for a general geoscience audience that is given by experts in one particular field, and their material is presented in a way that it not only appeals to the colleagues in the immediate field, immediate field but also to other sciences within uh, the EGU. Today we have the first of these two talks, tomorrow the next one. Today's topic is water in terrestrial systems, and the speaker is Professor Kurt Rott from the University of Heidelberg. Kurt, please. Yo, Günther, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, for bringing up the idea of looking at scales. Uh, and to all of you, thank you for spending your time uh, in this uh, afternoon uh, with sharing some ideas. Um, what I would like to uh, do, I would like to, can you use that one? Uh, I would like to go through that uh, topic in uh, four steps. Uh, first, through an orientation, uh, look at the way how we move up the scales. Uh, we will find very tough challenges there, uh, but I will come to technological advances that we have uh, to surmount them and come to the uh, take-home uh, messages. First, orientation. Why is water in terrestrial systems of interest at all? Uh, second one, uh, we should look at the hierarchical organization of terrestrial systems. Uh, and then, of course, uh, address the question, why should we care about a uh, hierarchy of scales? Why should I not just enter at one particular scale uh, and uh, do my studies there? Uh, first thing, why is it interesting at all? Uh, and I take the perspective uh, from the physical environment, uh, just looking at how our environmental machinery works, uh, which basically uh, is uh, driven... Uh, that was a bit too fast, uh, which basically is uh, driven uh, by uh, shortwave uh, radiation coming in, uh, bringing something like 140 watts per square meter to the surface, uh, something like 60 uh, watts per square meter uh, are emitted again, meaning we have a difference between the two uh, that then drives uh, the sensible uh, flow uh, on the one hand, and the latent heat evaporation uh, on the other hand. Uh, and that, uh, in turn, is our, uh, or drives our hydrologic cycle uh, with a currency in here uh, that uh, one millimeter uh, per... Uh, that one millimeter of evaporation per day corresponds to 30 watts per square meter of uh, energy uh, that is uh, leaving the system per uh, second and uh, square meter here. Now, the second step, why is water and terrestrial systems interesting? Uh, taking the second part of our environment, uh, the social cultural uh, aspect, and that, of course, is uh, the production of food and uh, energy. Uh, we know that uh, some 70% of water that we, we as humankind withdraw from the environment is for biomass production. To just produce one kilogram of beef, uh, we uh, consume something like 15 tons of water. Uh, we then know that uh, some 40% of the food is produced from irrigated land uh, and that uh, a large fraction of the water uh, that is used for that uh, irrigation uh, is actually lost uh, to uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, if you just look at the total numbers, we find that we are... Uh, extracting from the environment something like a quarter of the accessible water, of the water that is accessible to humankind. Uh, 
Uh, the regional impact is uh, much more severe. Uh, large rivers like the Huangre, the Nile, or the, or the Colorado River regularly trickle out inland. They don't reach uh, the ocean. Uh, anymore. And if you read newspapers about the current uh, crisis in California, the current water shortage, uh, there of course we have a, uh, a more modern uh, aspect uh, to it. Uh, there is a short time a solution to all this, that is uh, groundwater mining of course, which is an unsustainable uh, consumption as we are pumping out the oil and just consume it. We pump out the water, consume it, it will not be uh, refilled uh, within uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, one of the examples is the High Plains uh, aquifer over here, where we have a, a decline, something on the order of 50 meters uh, since its development. Uh, North China Plain is even worse. Uh, we have an even stronger uh, decline there. Uh, now, the problem is going to be more severe in the next uh, a few decades since population is expected to grow from the current 7 billion to 10.5 billion by 2050. Uh, that estimate has been corrected uh, from 9 billion up to 10.5 billion just last year. Uh, so uh, we are uh, looking at some uh, problems ahead. Uh, and that, of course, also leads to an uh, uh, increase of the consumption predominantly in the uh, agricultural uh, sector uh, shown over here, uh, also domestic and industry. Uh, but just looking at the curves down here, uh, we see the uh, total extraction, uh, but the lower curve here is the actual consumption, uh, meaning the gray shadow here uh, is what is recycled. Of course, we see we have a lot of leverage on domestic and industry water to recycle, uh, but that's very tough to do uh, in the agricultural field. So that's going to uh, stay with us uh, for some time. Now, let's move to terrestrial systems. Of course, we all have a, a rough idea what terrestrial systems are. Just giving uh, some examples here. Uh, I will uh, comment some uh, on them uh, later on. Uh, what 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 are these uh, things structurally? Well, it's a, a conglomerate of a multitude of physical, chemical and biological systems and processes who are closely linked, closely interacting. And they have close links to the sociocultural sphere. Uh, we see that uh, in the examples over here. That's a somewhat untouched uh, uh, environment over here, but if we go to that uh, pothole prairie in North Dakota, we already see that it's dominated by natural processes, uh, but it's already strongly modified by the agricultural here, uh, whereas if we go to a place in Germany, uh, it's an agricultural landscape that is a little bit modified by uh, remnant uh, natural structures. Uh, the scales that we are uh, looking at in space is something like 14 orders of linear magnitude in space uh, from the uh, 100 nanometers that are relevant if you are looking at clay minerals with uh, adsorption uh, of chemicals, of uh, heavy metals for instance, uh, all the way to the 10,000 kilometers of the global scale. And indeed, if you would be uh, looking at time, we also find something like 14 orders of magnitude. Uh, if you just like 10, that's uh, uh, as good as well. Uh, where we are thinking, uh, say, of the order of a minute uh, characteristic for a landslide to something like 200 million years for the formation uh, of soil layers. Uh, as that image over here, these layers have been deposited some 200 million years ago, just to give a, uh, a relation that is half the time uh, that... Uh, Looking back these 200 million years that life on land surfaces on this planet evolved. Uh, so we are uh, really looking uh, deeply back uh, in time. Uh, I'm sure we will hear more on that uh, topic uh, tomorrow. Um, now, 
let me illustrate that uh, multi-scale architecture with a focus on Sol. We could have other foci, uh, and I guess you uh, imagine these uh, yourself. In the following, I will just show you a number of images, and I would ask you uh, to just observe the structures in uh, each of these uh, images. Uh, and uh, at the uh, corresponding scale. Uh, starting out at the global scale, where we see the distribution of soils uh, closely related to the ecosomes, uh, of course. Uh, and you always look at the structures uh, that you are seeing here. Uh, so, zooming into uh, part of that, uh, into Germany, uh, we see the distribution of soils here, mainly uh, determined by uh, geology, geomorphology, uh, again zooming in uh, into a f uh, field in uh, northern uh, Germany here, uh, which apparently uh, is dominated by uh, our society, by uh, agricultural use. Uh, zooming into one uh, of these fields here, uh, we uh, see how part of the soil structures uh, just uh, kind of penetrates the surface and becomes uh, visible at that one. Uh, we zoom into uh, a field, actually not that particular field, uh, that another one near Heidelberg, uh, and we uh, realize that we have uh, very complicated, fascinated structures here, uh, soil layers with uh, very uh, pronounced uh, transitions here, uh, and finally zooming uh, deeply into that profile at the scale of uh, one millimeter, uh, we see the largest pores here, something like 100 micrometers. That's actually the largest scale already where soil physicists believe that we understand the physics of the system. We are not really sure that we understand uh, the problems at the uh, larger scales here. At that scale, uh, up to may, say, uh, maybe 50 micrometers, we are somewhat confident that we understand what we are, uh, I mean, really understand what we are doing. Uh, now, lo look at that uh, whole scene. Uh, we uh, have uh, an illustration of 10 linear orders of magnitude. You realize I mentioned 14 uh, in the beginning, uh, but we still have uh, a few orders uh, to go down uh, from here to still uh, smaller pieces here. Uh, we realize at each of these scales we have relevant structures that we would want to represent if we would want to say anything about the process at any of these particular scales. Uh, thinking about uh, what led to that uh, structures, uh, we immediately recognize that these are different generators at different scales, and that in turn, uh, I think, would convince us that there probably are no simple transitions between scales. That's, we will find uh, if you go to the atmosphere or to the ocean, the situation is completely different. There we just have one single generator, and there we can scale through all the scales that's not possible uh, in terrestrial systems. Uh, I hope to convince you on that one. Now, why should we care about uh, all that hierarchy? Uh, and I just take one example. I mean, most of our interest is at larger scales. Uh, we look at the prediction of uh, expected change in runoff in percent. Uh, and they, these are significant numbers. These are minus or plus 40% uh, change in runoff. Uh, and for those who are a little bit into the operation of System Earth, uh, we realize that an increase of runoff in the uh, Arctic here has potentially dramatic uh, implications for our uh, climate, uh, since it will uh, affect the, uh, uh, the change uh, or the uh, creation of Atlantic deep water in, in the North uh, Atlantic. Now, the question at that point is, do we really understand the relevant processes at the scale required here? The processes there 
that are at the base of the models that are used to make these predictions. And to uh, give some indications what we currently probably don't understand at that scale, we look at the precipitation feedback uh, with a changing magnitude of the hydraulic cycle, with thereby adapting vegetation and adapting geomorphology. That's quite beyond our current uh, uh, grasp. I mean, we do have the ideas, but we cannot do it quantitatively. Uh, with that, I think uh, we need to project our small-scale understanding, uh, our tough scientific understanding, to the scale of interest where we need to uh, give answers. Now, that brings us uh, on the way up the scale, or... Uh, what do we do uh, if we don't just presume a representation, just presume a model, as we usually have to do if we just have to give uh, answers? Uh, now, here I'm looking at uh, three steps. First is averaging. Uh, next one is the self-similar staircase, meaning if the world would be self-similar, scale-independent, what could we do? could we be doing then, uh, and then assess, is that feasible for terrestrial systems? It will not be feasible. Still, we will get inspiration what we should do, or what we could do uh, in our fields. Now it's getting a little bit more technical. Uh, for those who are into that field, and I've uh, picked a field where I feel uh, somewhat at home, uh, but what I'm saying is uh, quite general for all other fields. Uh, so I suggest uh, for those who are into it, uh, please enjoy it. Uh, for, for the other ones, uh, lean back, enjoy the performance and wait for the final uh, conclusions uh, that come out of this uh, little bit uh, abstract uh, transparencies. Uh, now, we are interested in the upscaling in this example from the poor scale to continuum representation all the way to a heterogeneous continuum. Why do we do that? We understand the physics at the poor scale, but uh, we are interested to understand the systems at that much larger scale here. Uh, our aim is, the aim of upscaling uh, is to express a system's state and its development. So not just the state or the material properties or anything, but also its development, its basic equations. Uh, to express state and development at the macroscopic scale uh, in terms of states and development at the microscopic scale. That's quite a... Uh, a challenging uh, aim to uh, do that, but I think that's what we need to do. The method that I'm going to use here uh, shortly is averaging over a representative uh, volume. Uh, and prerequisites that we uh, need for that is first a finite microscopic scale or which we can average. That is the point that always has been emphasized uh, with that theory. We will see it indeed is a minor point. Uh, the major point that is uh, not so often emphasized is that we need local equilibrium such that the macroscopic state that we are interested in only depends on a few averages of the microscopic state. If this is not the case, we still can proceed, but then it becomes real tough. Uh, now comment to the uh, microscopic scale uh, first. Uh, there are methods that can handle situations where we do not uh, have a scale. Uh, they are not as general uh, anymore. Uh, they do apply for dissipative systems, which fortunately uh, terrestrial systems are typically dissipative. Uh, so the first point is not really a major issue. Uh, now, I uh, want to bombard you a little bit with some uh, mathematical formalism, uh, but again, you just wait for the highlight uh, I'm pointing to, because uh, I want to show how uh, that actually operates such that we understand the key challenge in, in, in that process. Uh, and what I've uh, written down here is the uh, average microscopic conservation of mass, uh, the microscopic density here. We integrate over a large volume, uh, take the derivative uh, with time and just say, okay, that needs to be uh, 
the microscopic flux into that volume uh, and just needs to be uh, equal. So we are integrating over that volume and we look at the flux through that volume. Uh, take a bathtub, uh, whatever is changing in the bathtub has to be flowing uh, into or out of it uh, easy. Uh, okay. Uh, then we apply the mean value theorem to that one uh, and immediately come to the difficult issue here. And this is, this I call it a covariance term here uh, between microscopic properties. We have an integral here that is the product of two microscopic quantities. We need to know that number. That's a benign case here actually uh, because the uh, density here depends on the pressure whereas the velocity depends on the gradient of the pressure, meaning the two are in a random field are statistically independent, uh, meaning we can immediately uh, resolve that difficult covariance term. Why is that covariance term a challenge? Uh, because we need to know the, its microscopic distribution to evaluate it, but we don't want to do that. We want to get a result at the, microsco uh, at the macro scopic scale. But here it is easy. Uh, we uh, introduce the macroscopic quantities, uh, write down the macroscopic uh, conservation uh, of mass uh, that we have here. Now if we do exactly the same thing for a more difficult uh, situation where we are uh, looking at the flux law uh, of that uh, system, uh, we again write down our microscopic law, Stokes law, derived from Navier-Stokes equation uh, for that slow flow uh, that we are having here. Again, we are averaging uh, over, the, uh, uh, over a section of our porous medium, uh, proceed uh, to again identify that covariance term and at that point realize that this indeed is a troublemaker. We cannot resolve uh, that term easily anymore. What saves us at that point, and I should say wh why that is the case, uh, so that uh, constant kappa here uh, basically represents the geometry uh, of the medium uh, and the pressure gradient that is required to push an amount or a flux of water through a certain opening depends on the geometry uh, of that opening. So the two are related to each other. That's why we cannot uh, resolve it. Uh, what saves us, however, uh, is uh, that we have a linear law up here. So we know that our microscopic pressure gradient is proportional to the macroscopic pressure gradient. Using that information, uh, we can relate the microscopic gradient to the macroscopic here, introduce uh, the new quantity uh, and find our uh, flux law that hydrologists know as uh, Darcy's uh, law with the hydraulic uh, conductivity K here that we understand as a conglomerate of some fluid property and some geometry uh, property. Now for those who did not like the math, it's time to wake up and uh, uh, realize the two important things that uh, we should uh, take with us. Number one, averaging upscaling uh, in general leads to a difficult covariance term between different uh, microscopic quantities. That's always the killer problem when we do upscaling and we always have to ask uh, the question how, how has that been addressed in that upscaling step. Uh, we realized with a, a flux law uh, up here uh, that it's uh, comparatively easy to solve in a linear system. It's very, very hard in a nonlinear system. Uh, and uh, uh, Second point I want to make in terrestrial systems, uh, these upscaled parameter fields generally are entanglements of the flow and the architecture. Uh, the flow that is dynamic, the architecture that is static at this time scale of the flow of course. And that's a fundamental difference to atmosphere or ocean, where again we have, of course, entanglements, but typically flow-flow entanglements. And that's very much easier uh, than these things here. 
All right. Uh, now let's see what other fields that have been confronted with that situation have been doing. Uh, and I take an illustration from statistical mechanics. Uh, they're basically looking at critical phase transitions uh, also uh, raises the question uh, of upscaling. Uh, we look at, uh, say, a density uh, distribution in such a situation. Ooh, again, too fast. Uh, that uh, should be the density distribution in some fluid uh, with a certain uh, spatial resolution. First step uh, we did, and I'm going back to that. First step we are doing, we uh, average uh, that field just over a, a certain size, which is our upscaling that we have been doing before. Uh, I do it as a, a block. Uh, averaging here, uh, and uh, we get a coarse grained uh, representation of the field up here. Uh, now we uh, rescale uh, the whole thing such uh, that we have the original uh, resolution again, and we realize that the two things look quite similar. Uh, it of course brings in a whole new field of additional information, the larger field from the outside that has been uh, compacted uh, with uh, uh, rescaling here. And the whole idea here uh, in this uh, so-called uh, block transform uh, is uh, during that averaging and uh, scaling to learn how we have to do that, uh, how the interaction changes during such an upscaling a step. That's a little bit difficult with that continuous problem and it's becoming more easy if we uh, take a still a simpler problem of uh, spins. Just imagine some magnets that only can be upwards or downwards. Uh, they have some random arrangement uh, that depends on the temperature uh, and on the external field. Uh, of course, and again, we are interested at some large-scale representation. There's an interaction between uh, these uh, spins here. Uh, I call them the fundamental interaction, and they have some coupling constants uh, between one spin and the next, and the next to the next, and so on, throughout the entire field. So we have a, a large number of coupling constants uh, over here. The idea then uh, to block the thing, meaning to just uh, choose uh, to choose one spin to represent that block, the one over here, and to do it for all the other blocks uh, as well. Uh, and the uh, difficult stuff now uh, is, of course, to uh, come up uh, with a coupling constants at that coarse scale here. Uh, so, not just to average the spins, but to uh, obtain the new values for these coupling constants for the larger scale, for these blocks uh, between spins. That's a real difficult thing. Uh, next steps then, uh, rescale the whole thing and continue. Uh, once we have solved that issue, it's nice and beautiful. Uh, we realize uh, that this uh, a block transform actually can be uh, represented as a single step in a dynamical system. And the dynamical system, that's conceptually a little bit challenging. That's not a physical system as such. Uh, it's our representation of the physical system. That is uh, the dynamic system. So that system evolves as we do the upscaling. Okay, uh, and what we find uh, is uh, that this system evolves towards uh, a certain uh, low dimensional uh, environment, uh, which here is called a critical surface. Uh, and what the beautiful thing of that point is, uh, that critical surface is the upscaled representation. So imagine uh, we have here a very high dimensional space, with all the local interaction uh, parameters. Uh, we do that uh, imaging and come out with a very low dimensional uh, 
subspace of that uh, high dimensional thing and this indeed is our upscaled representation uh, the coordinates uh, on that critical surface uh, these are the relevant macroscopic variables we do not have to prescribe them a priori we do not have to suck our thumbs to understand uh, what the description uh, is here uh, that comes out from our basic work uh, to uh, calculate uh, that uh, block transform uh, that critical surface is reached by iterating that block transform, uh, which as I mentioned before is the key and very difficult uh, step uh, uh, before. Now, prerequisites uh, for that uh, system to be operational uh, is uh, that the system we are looking at is self-similar or at least nearly self-similar and that it is at equilibrium at all scales that we are uh, looking at here. Okay. That actually, uh, or at least the first step to that one, has been used in uh, hydrology uh, to upscale uh, hydraulic conductivity fields. Uh, here just illustrated by the uh, approach that uh, Renard uh, has been taking. Uh, uh, looking a little bit deeper and comparing to the uh, actual renormalization approach, we see a number of issues and prerequisites. Uh, number one, uh, all these ideas just work for stationary systems. We have not been looking at situations where the water content is changing, uh, for instance. Uh, in that uh, approach down here, we are calculating an average hydraulic conductivity, but we have learned before that whenever we do an upscaling, we invariably uh, get covariance terms. Why, why don't we get a covariance term uh, here? because we assume the uniform gradient. That's a severe assumption here, and it is wrong uh, in general. Uh, that's uh, why we miss the VK covariance terms here. Uh, then to actually use it operationally in a renormalization, uh, the system would indeed be self-similar. We will have to look at that uh, afterwards. And uh, of course, we presume that we have high resolution data and as hydrologists, we know uh, that's usually not the case. So let's take a look at the self-similarity uh, to get an idea if it is worthwhile uh, addressing that issue that we did not have the covariances up here. Uh, because if we find that our systems are self-similar, then it might be uh, worthwhile doing it. If not, uh, we probably have to look at other uh, situations. Uh, we go back to what we found before. Look at that system. Is that uh, self-similar? And we certainly say, well, not all systems and not at all scales. Uh, could it be that, uh, say, part or an individual system uh, is uh, self-similar? I just want to take uh, one particular uh, system. I uh, actually obtained all that material from uh, Sina Muster from uh, AV Potsdam. Uh, and we are uh, looking at the uh, size distribution of the lakes here uh, with the example of the Mackenzie Delta. Uh, but Sina actually has uh, data for the uh, entire polar uh, region uh, of that one. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that we do get uh, very high resolution, very comprehensive data. Uh, for instance, uh, this uh, Terrasar X uh, data, uh, a 10 kilometer scale here with a resolution uh, down to one meter. Uh, that scene here, it's, uh, it's just part of the uh, scene that I'm showing is actually something like 1,600 square uh, kilometers. Uh, we take another uh, scene in the same region, but a uh, somewhat different uh, uh, geologic uh, setting with a different and apparently different distribution of lakes here. Um, uh, same uh, scale. Uh, down here, and now we look at the size distribution. Uh, what Sina uh, calculated was the uh, number of lakes per square kilometers that are larger than a certain area, 
and the area is shown down here in units of square kilometers. Uh, choosing uh, logarithmic scales uh, in both directions, uh, we know that if we have a scale-free distribution, uh, we should see straight lines uh, in here. And uh, we say, well, maybe, maybe that could be a straight line, or we would accept it as a straight line for something like an order of magnitude size differences here. Uh, how, how does it look like if we go through the entire range here and we realize lakes are not scale-free, even though they might be uh, for some part here. The distribution of large lakes uh, down here is comparable between different uh, places, but it's certainly not comparable anymore if we go to small lakes. Hence, uh, a simple renormalization would not be feasible for that problem. Why, why do we care about these lakes in polar regions? Well, they play an important role in the methane uh, emission. And of course, uh, this is distribution of large lakes uh, we can uh, obtain from satellite uh, images. Uh, so uh, it is tempting uh, to just extrapolate the size distribution that we gained from a coarse picture core scale picture to the smaller scales to extrapolate the methane uh, emissions. Uh, but that only works if uh, the scaling law uh, is satisfied, uh, of course. Now, let's face our challenges. Uh, still, we are thinking about addressing water issues in terrestrial systems through a whole range of scales, our theme here. And the challenges are, uh, our systems are uh, non-stationary, they are coupled to the atmosphere, uh, so that collides with our requirement of local equilibrium. Uh, the systems are highly nonlinear. think of uh, soil water movement, of surface water uh, movement, think of vegetation, and that collides with the calculation of the covariance terms, which is extremely difficult if the uh, processes are nonlinear. And uh, the systems are typically not scale-free, but they uh, exhibit structures on many scales. And that, uh, of course, tells us we have to do these difficult upscaling steps for every single step. That's just a lot of work. And then, of course, uh, we do have insufficient data. Uh, we know very little about the architecture of the subsurface, about the coupling uh, of land to the atmosphere at the various scales. We understand a lot of concepts, but when it comes to practical numbers, uh, it's not so easy anymore. At that point, one might just say thank you and leave the room and say that's just too hard a problem. Uh, but I guess we don't want to do that and we still have a few minutes. So uh, let's look at te technological advances uh, that tell us why we might stay in business, why it actually might be uh, challenging and promising uh, to stay in business. And I want to talk very shortly about uh, three things. Measurements, numerical simulations, representations. Now, measurements. Uh, starting with ground, penetrator, uh, ground penetrating radar, which basically was an engineering instrument to qualitatively look at the subsurface. It has evolved uh, over the last, say, 10 years, uh, something really from such a qualitative instrument to a high precision instrument for soil hydrology. I do not want to uh, go into detail uh, here since there is a specialized uh, talk uh, on that one. I want to emphasize uh, another uh, approach that also evolved over the past, say, 10 years. Uh, that's uh, the installation of wireless sensor networks that provide us with a wealth of very high temporal resolution data with a decent spatial resolution and with a still good accuracy. Uh, the example here uh, taken from the uh, publication of Rosenbaum uh, and uh, co-workers uh, and I'm not going to discuss the details here. There are a number have already been and still will be a number of beautiful talks uh, in uh, this meeting. Uh, so I just uh, kind of can enjoy uh, the uh, image or we together can enjoy the image and the implications of it. Uh, what such a network uh, gives us uh, is a um, so far 
unprecedented amount of data in a quality we really did not have before. Uh, that's a, uh, in the meantime, a little bit a famous graph because something like that just was not uh, feasible uh, in that detail before. Uh, and it shows the average volumetric water content at the site. Uh, and as a function of that, when the fluctuation or the standard deviation uh, of the water content, uh, colleagues can read many things uh, out of these numbers. What we uh, immediately realize that apparently the data uh, separate uh, groundwater distance distant locations from groundwater uh, influenced locations and uh, following the uh, lead from the uh, previous presentation by uh, Hoops and I, uh, I would say, okay, now let's lean back, let's look at those data and let's start thinking what they actually tell us and maybe we also need some other uh, presentation and some deeper thinking uh, about that. But we already have uh, some interesting insight uh, from these data. And of course we have many more uh, measurement systems operating right now, not all of them with the quality and specificity uh, that these two systems that I just mentioned have with respect to salt water content. Uh, but these systems range in scale from millimeter uh, to global coverage, if you're just thinking of neutron tomography at the millimeter scale, to small or grace uh, with a global coverage, uh, with some issues in resolution and specificity uh, to water content, but still uh, we are in an age where we have an really unprecedented stream of data, of, very, of various data uh, concerning uh, terrestrial systems. Next thing, uh, of course we have numerical simulations and we always had numerical simulations, well always uh, in most of our lifetime I would like to say. Uh, but we are now really approaching uh, a, uh, a point where we can resolve the physical required detail for systems that are of a significant size that such that we can trust our physical representation but still calculate at the scale where we are interested in gaining uh, some answers. Uh, and I obtained the material from uh, Olaf Ippisch at uh, Theo Klausthal uh, uh, on that uh, topic here. What uh, Olaf has been doing, he uh, chose a uh, virtual soil block uh, 10 by 10 by 10 meters and he did it with a resolution of 10 millimeters. That produced 1 billion notes uh, and of course he uh, require that small computer uh, in the background here to actually calculate uh, uh, what is going on. But the advantage of that stuff is uh, he could represent every detail we could think of to be important for the flow of water uh, in this system here. Uh, starting with the tractor ruts uh, going on here uh, with some compaction layer uh, down here, some earthworm channels. Uh, rough uh, horizon boundaries, uh, heterogeneity, uh, everything could be uh, included in here. Of course, uh, the practitioners among us are thinking, oh, that's great, how do I get the numbers? Uh, but that's, that's another issue. Here we are just looking at if we would have the representation. Could we actually solve it? And yes, we can. Uh, the whole thing, uh, Olaf was uh, running with uh, natural rainfall, uh, can add uh, evaporation to that one. Uh, and what we find, uh, first thing is, uh, with a spatial resolution of 10 millimeter, we really have uh, a trustworthy process representation with very few heuristic approximations. We can, of course, represent uh, systems at larger scales, uh, but then we need typically rather strong heuristic approximations. We still need uh, parameters, of course. Uh, with such a high resolution representation, we can address processes like uh, evaporation, salinization. If you just uh, look back at that uh, image here, uh, the tractor ruts here, uh, we recognize they, they are still pretty wet. Uh, as you see uh, down here, uh, whereas uh, between them uh, the surface is dry. So all uh, 
practically all the evaporation uh, will occur through these ruts. And of course, if we have, we, if we are in a salinization prone environment, uh, these ruts will also uh, become salinized. Uh, we can study these uh, processes in great details. Uh, if you are interested in solid transport and reactions, uh, thinking of nitrate, uh, uh, washing to groundwater or microbial activity, uh, think of greenhouse emissions, uh, all these processes really operate at the millimeter scale and they crucially depend on the local water saturation because uh, uh, involved uh, uh, microbial communities uh, are, uh, so some of them are obligatory uh, anaerobic, so we need to know the water content uh, type precision. Uh, that's uh, an opportunity to approach it. Uh, so, we have impressive data and models, and the question, is anything missing? For the simple case of soil hydrology, of course, or do we have everything? Uh, of course, something is missing. Uh, we miss, actually, two large things are missing. The embedding in the environment. Uh, so we need a coupling to the atmosphere, precipitation and evapotranspiration, coupling to surface waters, uh, to groundwater, lateral uh, exchange. We need to say something about it. And we know these are the fundamentally tough issues because they are determined from the outside. We can't know it from the inside. And the next one, of course, are the material properties, soil architecture, soil hydraulic properties, vegetation, including roots. So uh, a lot of work uh, still missing. What we are aiming for is to aggregate, and maybe before reading that, I should say, uh, our traditional approach was, uh, if we have uh, our uh, equation that describes a soil water movement and if we have all the information I was asking before that we should have it, we can just go ahead and calculate the whole thing. Uh, by just leaning back and thinking, do we have a chance to get that information, we realize no, we don't. So that's uh, the point where I think we have to uh, reconsider uh, our approach and that's uh, the outcome, uh, uh, in my opinion, what we should uh, strive for is to uh, aggregate all the information that we have available on the dynamics, which is the physics at the scale of interest, uh, the architecture, including the material properties, and material properties are representations of the subscale physics that we cannot represent uh, at the scale of our interest, uh, the embedding, that is the coupling to the larger uh, scale, and the trajectories, meaning the observations with their spatial and temporal relations. Without these relations, uh, uh, observations are quite useless. Uh, and we want to aggregate all that into one consistent representation of observed reality. Possible approaches, and I cannot go uh, really into those anymore, are hierarchical models inspired by renormalization. I uh, was aware when preparing it that pushing you through the ideas of renormalization would not make you perfectly happy, uh, but still I thought that was an idea worthwhile uh, grasping such that we can start to think about uh, applying hierarchical models. Uh, and then by iterated data simulation, data simulation of course is an established technology, uh, to ascertain the consistency in that uh, aggregates that we uh, aim uh, up here. And I'm coming to my uh, final point, just a glimpse at what we are currently thinking uh, how that can be done or how it would look like. As a motivation, we take a very simple situation compared to what we had before. Just a series of measurements of uh, soil moisture uh, content uh, as a function of time. Uh, then we have some forcing. Uh, we have so the coupling to the atmosphere. We make uh, every other, uh, uh, everything else simple. Uh, evaporation precipitation here that is driving uh, this system over here. And we have a very simple architecture, uh, just five layers, 
this very deep uh, layer here and four uh, intermediate uh, width uh, layers. Uh, we look at the time of something like 10 days. Uh, then uh, what uh, Hannes Bowser was actually doing, he was looking at the synthetic aggregation of the dynamics, material, material properties, atmospheric forcing and measurements. And he did it by an iterated data simulation using the uh, ensemble Kalman filter. Uh, and the final uh, point uh, to demonstrate what is coming out of it. Uh, uh, I show the first iteration where he simulated an augmented state, meaning the water content together with the material properties. The initial state is wrong, the atmospheric forcing is wrong. We just assume we have no idea or, well, we can estimate evapor transpiration, but we don't really know it. It's too hard uh, to measure. If we have it wrong and we insert that wrong thing into our simulation, we're just running it havoc. Uh, so that's what we want to improve uh, here, actually. So he is uh, iterating that thing uh, a few times to give the model a chance to learn how to best uh, kind of uh, choose the parameters, uh, uh, choose the atmospheric forcing. So in the end, we see uh, after 12 iteration, uh, still the assimilated state. Uh, the in initial state is still wrong. We just say we have no idea what to do about it. Uh, actually, we could do it, but uh, just for the sake of the example here. And the atmospheric forcing has been uh, adapted uh, by the uh, state updates. Uh, what we uh, see here is as a function of depth, volumetric water content, the black line is a truth. In general, we don't know the truth, of course. That's the advantage of the synthetic state here. Uh, the uh, red points are the measurements uh, of uh, that truth, and the measurements have uncertainties, of course. Uh, and then uh, he is running a whole ensemble of models, and the ensemble mean is that uh, thick blue curve. Uh, and what we uh, now, the model is just uh, running, excuse me, too fast, is uh, running uh, through that uh, simulated time uh, up here, and we can just uh, observe how the system is uh, adapting, meaning uh, the measurements are fluctuating, reality of course, I should start with reality, reality is fluctuating, measurements are running with them, uh, and the uh, uh, simulated model is also trying to run behind it. Uh, Please notice we have assumed no measurements down here. Uh, and in the first iteration, the system is not able to learn anything about what's going on down here. But in the twelfth iteration, we have pretty good represent representation of that system here. So that's what I think uh, is the way to go, uh, that we need to have a consistent environment uh, to uh, conglomerate all the various informations that we have from the various channels of our observed reality. It's not just running a forward model or inverting uh, some model or doing something like that. We must address the ins uh, entire package. With that, we are slowly coming to the take-home uh, messages. Uh, I really would like you to take home as the very first thing uh, the hierarchical organization of terrestrial systems over all scales that we can think of. Uh, that these structures are not self-similar to any useful extent. That upscaling generally introduces covariance terms, and these are the killer terms. Once we have resolved that issue, things are very easy. Why upscaling? Because we only understand small-scale processes faithfully. Uh, but of course we need to have answers at a larger scale. And terrestrial systems are set apart uh, from atmosphere and ocean by their entanglement and, of flow and architecture. Why, why do I emphasize that one? Well, uh, because our colleagues in atmosphere and uh, ocean sciences are quite a bit uh, ahead of us operationally theoretically, and we are sometimes tempted to just copy-paste what they have been doing. That's a warning uh, that we should think if uh, the copy-pasting is really that easy. 
but then a message of hope, of course, is that new approaches to gain comprehensive representation and understanding are really uh, available now. It's not the dream that they might emerge somewhere. It's available now and it's exciting time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Kurt, for this inspiring talk. There is five minutes left. If you have any questions, please. Yes, please. Can I, can, please use the microphone. Good. I have uh, one simple question. Is about uh, what you call representation, what I normally call characterization of the heterogeneity. You, you need to characterize the heterogeneity so you can upscale. So how do you deal with the unmapped, uh, you, you can map the soil and then do all these things, but when you go to a place where you, you don't have that thing, how do you extrapolate from what you learn from one place to another place, and that's number one. Second thing is, for the heterogeneity that we deal with, um, is there any role, any place for time to come in? Because the, the theme of this talk is voyage through scales, and, and these heterogeneities, uh, you can look, look at them as they exist, or you can look at them as they have evolved, they've come to a place now, so can we learn from what, how they came about and then use that in some ways to build that gap, fill that gap? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Siva. Uh, challenging questions, uh, both uh, right to the point. Um, uh, first, uh, addressing the one, what can we do about uh, environments where we do not have any measurements? And in the example I showed, in the lowest layer, we did not have any measurements. Uh, but we did have a physical connection between uh, these layers. So hydrology linked uh, these layers. Uh, so if the influx or the, uh, of information of the unmapped uh, layer is strong enough, then we can resolve part of what is uh, down there. Uh, if there is no link, we don't have any chance. We must have information, some information. What I do think uh, with these uh, methods uh, we, uh, that we have uh, the opportunity uh, to uh, get out the best of all the available information with a minimum of input of heuristic presumptions, prejudices, what, whatever. Now, the second one, uh, I like it even more, uh, actually. Uh, where, uh, how, how did these uh, structures come about? Can we learn something about it? Uh, now, that, that really would be high art, uh, so to say, in, in the sense that we are uh, saying, uh, or my, my standpoint here was, well, we've, we have some dynamic flow in a static environment. And you are rightly saying, well, wait a minute, we also have a dynamic environment. Now, I do not see anything that would have to be changed conceptually. Uh, I would go exactly along the same lines we would hit exactly the same issues. Uh, and uh, I see two paths, basically. Uh, one is to say, well, we have some very fast processes, say, a flood. Uh, I have to include that one into the dynamics. Uh, and then I still have the geology will not uh, operate very rapidly, except we go to that uh, 100 million year scale. And then, of course, we have a completely different situation. Uh, and the other one, uh, where we say, well, these two scales are comparable. Then, of course, we are in a new setting. Then we have to come up with laws uh, that describe uh, the evolution uh, of that system. And still, I think we are making progress in these directions. If I look at uh, all the approaches that are uh, going on, uh, with, for instance, vegetation patterns, with uh, changes of geomorphology, uh, with changing environmental processes. But I think we are 
quite a bit away from a solid understanding there. We, we have a lot of good heuristics. Okay, thank you very much, Kurt. One final question or comment? Let me ask you a final question about the entanglement of flow and architecture. This is what sets us apart from other disciplines. Could you comment how to resolve this, or how, how this difference from like oceanography, atmospheric sciences, how this would manifest in the way we pr proceed? Okay. Um, well, f first I should say what maybe may more explicitly, what do I mean uh, with it's easier in the, uh, say, fluid uh, environments, where we basically have the uh, generator that leads to these hierarchical structures, uh, basically is just the inertia term in the Navier-Stokes equation. And that term is scale invariant. It operates from the uh, global scale all the way down to, uh, to the Kolmogorov dissip uh, dissipation scale. Uh, once we recognize that, when we know we can scale up and down as we like. Now, in uh, our situation, uh, in principle, we could also do that uh, because uh, water flow in a porous system, of course, is described by the same equation. We don't have an inertia term, which makes it simpler. Uh, but then we have the boundary conditions, and these fixed boundary conditions, the porous medium, uh, the permeable and less permeable parts, they break uh, that symmetry. And that uh, leads to a situation where, uh, number one, we must understand the hydraulics of the uh, flowing uh, fluid. And number two, we must understand the architecture of that system in its hierarchy. And that's why I think it's very important to uh, lo look at these multi-scale structures. And we should keep it in mind uh, to just, uh, as I said, not uh, kind of just uh, copy the simple situations. Yep. And I guess we, we are both in the generation where we had the stochastic hydrology, where we copy-pasted uh, turbulence theory, uh, basically applied it, and 10 years later realized, oops, we have a frozen random field. It's not really a fluctuating one. And then we realized that a whole lot of difficulties are coming with that one. But we sort of survived it, and we understand more right now. Okay, thank you very much, Kurt. Before you leave, an announcement. Tomorrow, same time, same lecture hall, we'll have the other talk for a general geoscience audience on the theme about the continental crust. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much again, Kurt, for this enlightening talk.